become who we want to be as individuals. And at the end of the day, that's going to help us be a successful offense. And the man, one-on-one coverage because the safety rolls to Jefferson's side. Jordan Love hit me up the night of the draft. You know, was just congratulating me, letting me know it's time to work. Um, AJ Dillon was open arms. Von Rock caught a ball with his thighs. We didn't nah. talk about that. It was more of with his ass. If he throws a good ball, this is a running, catching touchdown untied. Right. Like, if KP does like these flips after every win, and I'm like just waiting for him to do his flip. You know that we still love each other? That's what football brings us. Across the safety space. You can tune in anywhere that you guys follow us on social media. Welcome to the Practice Squad Pod. My name is John. I'm joined by my co-host, Mark. This is episode 49. We're coming up to... Well, I guess a year's worth of episodes, right? 49 or 49 or, you know? Yeah. So we've, uh, we've been going for a little over a year now. I think it was like, like April of last year that we started up, but we only kind of did episodes once every couple of weeks or once a month to start. So finally a year's worth of episodes we're coming up on, uh, which feels like an awesome milestone. And what's cool is that, you know, while a lot of our short form stuff has kind of popped off throughout the time we've been doing this, uh, Last week's episode was the best performing long form full hour plus long podcast we've had to date. So it was some awesome validation and we appreciated everybody that tuned in and we appreciate you if you're new here uh, checking us out for, you know, the first time um, because we're going to keep shit going all season long. Mark, how you doing? I'm good, man. I think you have to credit some of that, uh, some of that long form luck um and more viewership to joe svengros right <laughs> it's uh, no coincidence the episode that uh big joe svengros is on yep um yep he was biggest guest through. that we've maybe ever had yeah, actually, i mean he came on amidst it. a tornado right there yeah. was no stopping him he was coming on tornado was happening outside of chicago um and that episode just turns out to be the best one we've done yet so coincidence i don't know i think yeah. not Hey, you know, correlation and causation. Got to be careful there, but you know, who knows? Um, um, but I, I'm good, John. I'm I'm excited because training camp is uh, just underway. getting underway. Players are reporting for for camp. Uh, reached out to a couple guests that we were going to try to have on for this episode, and they were not able because they are literally going to uh, their respective city where they're going to be living for the next few months uh as part of an nfl team and they're reporting so this is like the busiest part of the year for them moving all their shit yep. getting their mind right getting their body right uh for camp which is hell yeah and we'll you know we'll start catching those guys during bye weeks that's when we had the best luck kind of getting some nfl caliber guests on and we definitely will be doing that again hopefully in an upgraded fashion this coming season as well um so look today's the the afc east episode I'm really excited about this division for a few reasons. One, all four teams are good. I mean, this is another situation kind of like the AFC North that we covered where like it's going to be really tough to kind of, you know, reliably predict where each of these teams are going to end up to end the season. And not only that, but like, you know, Patriots are probably going to, you know, finish towards the bottom of the division. The Jets are potentially going to finish towards the top of the division. That's something that that division hasn't seen in, you know, a couple decades. So it's, it's pretty interesting because it's a new era in this division as well. In a, it being very competitive in a 20 year span of Tom Brady, Bill Belichick Patriots domination, where no one came close to topping them in that division. All of a sudden, you know, within the last couple of years, we've seen more and more competition with Brady exiting. Right. And I think that just shows you the greatness of Tom Brady, you know, because Bill Belichick's still there. But that Patriots team never was even close to losing that division, really. Yeah. Um, and the entire time they were there. And now you have four teams that could win it. I mean, four yeah. teams flat out. If any of these four teams won the division, it wouldn't surprise me, really. Right. Like, there are four good teams, like you said. There's not many divisions in the NFL that have all four teams competing for the top spot. Legitimately. It's, it's kind of like, a, you know... Tomlin esque, where Belichick's never going to coach a bad team, and the Patriots will right. always be always be competitive. But you are right; that era of just complete dominance uh, seems to have concluded, right? And you know, will Belichick have like a, a team that goes in the playoffs uh, or deep into the playoffs without Tom Brady? To be determined, I think. And we'll kind of get into this, um, you know, because there's there's a little less film to watch on the Patriots side of things uh, than some of the other teams. And honestly, I think a huge problem is his coaching philosophy and how, you know, for the longest time, he's kind of been able to get away with, we'll do it, whatever Patriot way, 
the, you know, guys on our roster don't matter. The guys on the coaches don't matter. We're going to, we're going to get it done. You know, I'm doing my best to channel his, his monotone grumpy old man voice here. Um, he's one of the only guys more monotone than both you and I, like he's <laughs> the most monotone person of all time. I mean, dude, press conferences. He's just like, what do you want me to say? Like, which he like, rules oh, press conferences. <laughs> I actually <laughs> love so his, good. um, but you know, it's interesting because I just we've talked about this too. We don't think that style of coaching, uh, you know, in the modern NFL, you you can get away with it anymore. So you have to adapt or you die. It's just, I've said it before. You adapt or you die. We've seen stubborn coaches. Uh, you know, for example, Mark D'Antonio, Michigan State had a great run. Years of beating Michigan. Years of competing with Ohio State. Years of being. I mean, they were in the college football playoff, right? Like they were one of the best teams in the country, and he had to exit because he refused to turn on his loyal assistant coaches when they weren't getting the job done. It was, Hey, get new assistant coaches that are more updated with how the offensive world is changing or lose. And they started to lose and he refused to fire everybody and start fresh. So he ended up stepping down. Belichick's kind of the same way. Like last year, you know, we'll get into this more with some film and stuff, but last year he refused to go outside of his network to bring in maybe an offensive mind that would benefit Mac Jones Instead, they bring in Matt Patricia, who doesn't have much offensive experience, let alone calling plays. Which that, that play did not go very well for the Patriots. Calling offensive football, I mean, you have to be three steps ahead at all times. Yeah. Um, it, it is it is one of the most challenging things. I've been around football my whole life, and I just in the last few seasons when I got into coaching started to have a role. I'm not, I'm not solely calling the plays either. Like It's not only on my shoulders, but having even a little bit of a role in, hey, we should call this here, we should call this here, is hard as hell, man. Because you got to know when to do it. You got you basically have to guess right. You have to know how to adjust if you don't see the look that you were expecting to see. You have to know how to build it around the personnel that you have, which changes every week. It's really, really hard to do. And if you don't have experience and you think you're just going to jump in and do it at the NFL, that I don't know how Bill Belichick thought that would work. Yeah. And again, I, I think it's because he's done similar shit like that in the past and it did work. And it's just it's a different era. Um, so like we're going to we're going to tackle kind of the, the newsworthy current events first for this episode and then we're going to hop into the division um we feel like we kind of made a mistake with that covering kind of like a, a little bit of a you know sad dark news event to end the episode and we're like uh, all right like sexual harassment like, hey, Pat Great. Fitzgerald She's- fired okay. sexual assault occurred in northwestern's locker room um, so, right, see you next week. week hope you yeah. guys enjoyed this like that wasn't so, exactly how we wanted to sign off but no not not quite so bad we planning. learned from that you know talk talk about adapting or dying uh we're gonna try to not do that to you guys this week and instead uh we're gonna hit you with a couple topics so first deandre hopkins going to the titans um and the joke is right like this is where star wide receivers go to die i guess because of the fact that you know their super bowl odds did not budge with him signing on he signed you know a lucrative but not insane contract i actually thought he'd get more money but shit man 13 million dollars a year ain't too bad for a wide receiver um who's you know probably past his prime is going to be a contributor absolutely um but you know the titans are kind of in like a not maybe a full rebuild but definitely kind of a reload phase right now Lots of question marks at quarterback, uh, you know, high amount of turnover on defense. They were very injured last year. Um, so we'll see what that looks like going into this year. There's a lot they're still trying to figure out. Will Vrabel make them competitive? Absolutely. Dude's a complete badass. But it was kind of a weird signing, uh, especially with the entire A.J. Brown situation. I mean, if you're going to pay, you know, a free agent receiver that kind of money, why don't you just keep the stud that you have in-house? Who's way in house? who's way younger. So Mark, I'm just curious, you know, your take on the entire thing. Um, I mean, DeAndre Hopkins, listen, if you're going to talk about, you want to play for this quarterback, you want to play with this quarterback, you want to win a Super Bowl, you want to do all these things. Um, and then when your time comes to make that decision and really it's just, it's up to him what he wants to do, right? There were several teams interested that were contenders that probably would have paid a little less. It kind of shows like you're still chasing the extra maybe couple million from Tennessee when he could have went to Buffalo or, you know, Detroit or one of these teams that have more of a chance to be successful. And you would have been a perfect fit for maybe a little bit less. And you chose to go take a couple extra more million dollars on a team that most people agree are going to struggle. Um, doesn't make a whole lot of sense, but you know, I guess you can't shame him, right? He's getting paid and he's going to help, hopefully help them compete. We'll see how it works out for him. But if he has a, you know, struggling year, not getting the targets he wants, not getting the balls thrown accurate, you know, 
where he can make plays, you went to go play with Tannehill and Malik Willis and Will Levis, all guys that there's big question marks around. So, and not to mention it's a run first team. Derrick Henry gets the ball 30 times a game. Like you're yeah. not going to get the same and get, looks. You getting got the Arizona. ball behind, you know, an offensive line that has not been performing, at least last year was not performing at the level that people was expe- expecting them to. I mean, Taylor Lewan is now a free agent too. And he was just a rock for them for years. So a lot, a lot of question marks going into Tennessee. Um, it's, it's an interesting situation. So it's a weird choice for sure. Yeah. Um, so that's, that's the first topic. Second topic is the running back market. And look, there's there's a video that we posted, you know, three weeks ago that I think it was just titled the running back market is broken. And it, it is right because of the fact that kickers on average are getting paid more than running backs. And there's two kind of, you know, things that, I, you know, I thought this through one is more, you know, football analytical. And the other one, I think, is more related to my vocation and how I'm kind of thinking about this. The first thing is that, you know, Mina Kimes pointed out that these running backs spend their prime on a rookie contract, right? By the time that they are free agents for the first time looking for that big deal, they are 25, 26 years old, maybe 27 years old. And that's literally statistically where damn near every running back in the NFL peaks, right? And so they're not getting rewarded for their performance through their prime years. And instead every team is handing them a contract based off of what they're expected to do in the future, which statistically speaking is they're going to decline from that point forward. Right? So that screws them over. It's actually the only average earnings that has not kept up with inflation in the past decade. Their, their average uh, payment has gone down and therefore uh, getting franchise tag is not really lucrative either. Um, The other aspect, and this is just kind of what I thought about being an economist, right, is, you know, quarterbacks, there's one quarterback on the field, and they're very, very pivotal to whether or not you're successful, and therefore they get a lot of money, right? And, you know, there's three wide receivers, there's a little bit more competition because people can lose their jobs a lot easier. Most of the time, there's like three running backs on a roster, and there's one, maybe two on the field at any given time, and they don't impact the game quite the same way that quarterbacks do. I think it actually hurts them a lot that there's only two or three on a roster versus wide receivers where you can have eight or nine wide receivers in a roster, right? 10, 15 offensive linemen on a roster, so on and so forth. But it's that unique position where there's one of them and they're pretty easy to replace. And therefore, they're all screwing each other because of the fact that, you know, none of them are going to get that big money contract because you only need one and they're pretty easy to replace. So, it sucks. And I actually think that there might be some kind of striking or, you know, collective bargaining or something that has to go into fixing this. Cause the result is that less guys are going to play running back. They're going to find other positions to play. Yeah. I'm uh, I agree with pretty much everything you just said. I'm stuck in the middle with what I really, you know, believe in terms of this, like, are they paid fairly? Should they be paid more at the end of the day? I mean, you talk about some of the arguing points, right. On both sides. Um, I think that the receiver position requires more skill, more um, harder skills to learn and not just natural things that you have. Running back is, in terms of mentally, probably the, one of the easiest to play in football. You're not asked, cha- you don't, you're not challenged really how smart are you, what's your football IQ. Like most of the time it's just do this, just do that. It's, you know, here's the ball, make a play happen. Uh, it's very, in- it's mostly instincts. And um, like you said, replaceable, right? Like there's maybe, you know, 10 to 12 running backs in the league that are like irreplaceable, you know? And when when I say irreplaceable, I mean like you're not, you're not going to find someone as good, but you'll find someone that does the job. You know what I mean? Um, I think the prime example of that is is Zeke Elliott and Tony Pollard the last few years. We watched that happen. They, They paid Zeke Elliott after his outstanding rookie contract, how that went for them. And then Tony Pollard, you know, like you said, within, you know, still those prime years of Zeke became even more effective and was getting a paid a fraction of what Zeke was. And you saw now Zeke is no longer with an NFL team yeah. and still isn't. And, and then now you the see thing is, Pollard can't get a contract. Can't Jacobs get a contract. can't get a contract. Saquon can't get a tra- contract. Those are probably three of the top 10 running backs in the league right now. Yeah. And that leads me to my a long-term deal. That leads me to my next point is you know, for so long, those 10 or 12 guys were still getting the money. And it was like the rest of the backs that were getting screwed. 
now literally a two of the top five or six running backs in the league without a doubt no one can argue it and Josh Jacobs and Saquon Barkley couldn't land a deal on time and are going to go into the season with major question marks of are they going to show up to camp are they going to sit out the year um you know what are they going to give physically to this to the team knowing that if something happens right like a career changing injury they don't have the insurance of well I got my contract you know um and I don't know really how I would handle that if I were them because it's tough to say no to a, a, a year where you're going to be getting the franchise tag kind of money. But like you said, the franchise tag money for running back is nowhere near what it should be uh, because they just don't value that position. It comes down to really just, like you said, you're replaceable. And no matter how good you are and, and no matter how much you think you've done for your team, let me ask you this, John. In the last few seasons, the New York Giants, they've had some success. They've had some rough years. But who do you think has been the most consistent thing in terms of when they're successful on that team? Yeah, I mean, it's it's Saquon being healthy. I right. Think, and least. I would say for the Raiders, any success they've shown, where do you think that that's where do you think that's come from? It's from the run game for sure. Right. And and so, the other thing that makes me it's like kind of bums me out is like the essence of football in a lot of ways is kind of defined by that position, right? Like yeah, the things that the we tone. love about football, the things that makes football fun is having like a badass hard nosed running back that can run through people. Like that's that's one of I'd say any football fan just loves when Derrick Henry can truck through somebody or stiff arm somebody. Like it's one of the most like football things about it's football. It's sideways, you know? man. So, it's si- I mean, Saquon like- Barkley has given up way more physically. He's taken way more hits. He's he's trained way harder. Um he's sacrificed his body way more than Daniel Jones has the last three years. And who got paid this off season? Mm-hmm. Daniel Jones. Uh, most people didn't agree with that. And Saquon Barkley doesn't get the money. But the problem is, is the quarterback position is that much more important. It's pivotal to winning. You can find another running back. And if Daniel Jones plays as good as they believe he will, and he plays like to the value that they paid him, the giants will be successful, whether they have Saquon or not. That's the truth. But if Daniel Jones left because they didn't pay Daniel Jones and they gave that kind of money to Saquon and they brought in some rookie or some guy that doesn't get the job done, Saquon's not going to take you solo to the promised land. He's not going to win you games by himself because the running game isn't as, it's not as explosive, right? It's not as home run hitting. Daniel Jones can score on any play because of his ability to throw the ball, right? So it's just how the game's changed. The the blocking too, right? Offensive line's a huge part of this as well. It's why the Lions, you know, were able to confidently pretty much clean out the running back room, add a new cast, and it's probably going to be just as good, if not better, next year because not because the running backs don't have question marks around them because I'm sure there is some questions, but because the the blocking is so good that it's impossible for them to F up. The irony really really is that the running game – is essential for quarterbacks to have success, no matter who your quarterback is. We've seen very few quarterbacks have success without a good running game as like the one, two punch. Um, You know, you look at like Josh Allen, Mahomes, probably some of the only guys that I've ever seen have success without a consistent running game at times. Um, And those are like two of the top guys in the league. Right. So the running back position will always be important. It's just the person playing running back isn't. I don't know if that makes sense to people, but no, you can it, it replace does. them. And and as long as you're, you can function and you know what you're supposed to do, which isn't hard to teach someone what to do at the running back position, as long as you run hard, protect the football, and can block a little bit, like you can survive. And as long as you accept a little bit less money than someone with the name Saquon Barkley is asking for, you can survive. Yeah, and again, I don't think Mark and I really agree with that. That just is the fact it of sucks. the matter, right? Um. So uh, I guess one question I do have before we kind of wrap up, go to our next topic and then get into the film for, for the AFC East is have you thought of any solutions? Is there any way to make it where, okay, the running back market is what it is, but it's also not super fair to the running backs. Can't, is there a way where they are more valued or getting more money in their pocket that isn't completely ass backwards and, you know, like is doing something silly. Like what's, what's a realistic solution to this problem? Um, Best thing I can think of is skill players in general are lumped together when it comes to what um, the franchise tag average is, right? You include quarterbacks in that? 
No, just now you're talking running backs, tight ends, wide running receivers, backs. tight ends. Exactly. Because somebody pointed out that offensive and defensive linemen are treated that way, which elevates the guards and the centers because tackles get paid more, quite a bit more on average. So I actually thought that was a decent solution. Then if you're getting franchise tagged, man, that's still a good chunk of money, right? Because you're getting the receivers in there. All of a sudden your tag is going up, you know, probably mm-hmm. Four or five million dollars versus what it currently is for the running back market. So yeah, it's not a bad. So I don't know if there really is a true solution though, John, with just the way that the cap is set up and with how the NFL's GMs, owners, coaches view positionally the importance. Right. I mean, if right. you went on a whiteboard and you just said put in order offensively, what's most important in terms of who we pay, who we make sure we keep happy on our. It's going to be quarterback. It's going to be probably a star receiver. You, like you said, offensive tackle, uh, probably a few more offensive linemen, and then tight end would probably be ahead of running back now, right. which is crazy to say. Running back, but like running back's gonna fall. Basically. It's gonna yeah. fall, and that's just that's kind of a common thing throughout the league. It's not just one team who thinks this. It stems back to like when Le'Veon Bell thought he was worth more money and chose to sit out, and it did not work out for him. And Ever since then, running backs have had this battle, and no one has really successfully sat out and gotten what they wanted as a running back. We've seen receivers threaten to do it and have success. We've seen quarterbacks for sure do it. Uh, I mean, hell, we've even seen some offensive linemen do it and get what they think they're running, worth. Yeah, the running back that's I don't like doing that, but do I mean, that. It, if that's what you have to do, that's what you have to do. I get that money comes first, and this is their profession. This is how they provide for their families and stuff, but – it sucks, man. I w- I hope there's some kind of solution because I really do think we are on the brink of, like you said, some kind of a strike or because running backs around the league, even guys that are happy, relatively happy with their pay, see this and they're like, that's that this ain't right. Mm-hmm. Like Saquon Barkley not getting paid and Daniel Jones getting paid. That ain't right. Right. Yeah. You know, I completely agree. So I like it's and it's and they know that they could be next. You know, Najee Harris sees that and thinks that could be me. Right. Like, right. Christian McCaffrey, that could be me. I mean, the, so, the rookies probably even see The rookies it are like, thinking it like, too. I mean, B. John Robinson oh, sees it like, is that gonna, are they going to do that to me in three years? Like, totally. I, right. I'm reminding everybody of Saquon when he came into the league, I'm going to light it up and I'm going to do it for three seasons. And what's going to happen? Is Atlanta just going to screw me over in, in three years? Yeah. I mean, everyone's yeah. thinking it's the same thing. Very I don't know. tough situation. Um, the other, the last thing that we want to talk about is uh, the Cleveland Browns and the Minnesota Vikings both dropped alternate uniforms. And man, I have always not been a huge fan of the Browns because, I mean, it's orange and brown. That is a very tough color palette to work with. And uh, these uniforms are not a whole lot of orange and brown anyways. So I guess but that's kind of sweet. the solution. But holy shit, are they sick. So somebody, NFL fashion advice here saying... Week two, both the throwbacks jerseys. I mean, this already might be the uniform matchup of the season. Like, love, love that so match. So sick. Like, that is one of the and, more badass uniforms. And the Bengals with their whiteout uniforms. Oh, yeah. Like, oh man, like this division's a, John, sick. the best alternates, and I don't know how teams screw this up. Detroit screwed theirs up. And and if you want to show Minnesota's here, because Minnesota's I think are awesome as well. Yeah, um, yeah the, the like announcement video they did for the, it. The announcement video was awesome too. Um, but I don't know what it is, but like you can't, you don't want to alter your uniforms too much, right? You want to you want to keep the original colors and just kind of, in a weird way, if you simplify them enough and you add like either like a lot of a white color or a lot of a black color, like a dominant color, um those are the best uniforms. They don't, don't overthink it. Like Detroit's done some weird things, but they, when they just went like they're all black alternates and changed nothing else about the uniforms besides like the main solid color, that was the best uniform we've seen Detroit do. Um, you know, some, sometimes you see these teams do too much with their alternates and, and like Seattle does too much when they go like full neon. Right. Um, some of these uniforms when they go alternates and it's just a clean, smooth one color with, you know, their actual colors is kind of like a side. Those are the best. Like Cleveland did it right. Yeah. Cleveland absolutely did it right. Simple, effective. I would say the only, um, you know, exception that I'm thinking of in my head is the the Dolphins uniform. Yeah, that those last sweet. year. But that, that teal is is so it's, unique. And like, it's like the so neon cool. green, yeah. the neon green's overdone. I mean, every wow. sixth grader. Well, you that's know, yeah, that's what we talked about. Puberty is where exactly <laughs> has worn has worn those neon socks, Nike elites with Nike, 
Nike shorts, Nike elite shorts gown that basically touch the socks becomes like a, looks like sweatpants. Right. You got the neon shirt with it. And then don't forget a neon flat bill hat. Yeah. I mean, it's, uh, it's tough. Um, I think honestly, as a, as a uniform designer to get right, other than just going for full whites or blacks a lot of the time, because of the fact that, like you said, like people don't like change even. So when you're hitting them with something crazy different, like yeah. most of the time, look it just look doesn't at, resonate. Even the Steelers, the Steelers alternate, ha- it keeps the original one-sided Steeler logo on the helmet. The helmet's not very, it's pretty much the same. They're, even the uniforms are not much different. It's just they changed. They took a little bit of the white out, right? So it was just black and the gold, right? It's slightly right. different, but it stands out because you're used to seeing such a similar thing every single game. We've done, and we've done, we've done YouTube uh, shorts and TikToks on like u- uniforms. Just uniforms and brands. Just uniforms. Yeah. And so. some of those in the past are sweet. And some teams do it right. Like I think the uh, creamsicles are sweet. Well, that is going to be honestly, and I think those probably an eyesore for that game because the Lions are going to have their all. I don't know, man. Too. It's going to, I I'm think gonna it's like, going to be oh, sweet. There's so many colors going on here. Um, all right, so let's let's crack into this AFC East division. Um, kudos to Drew for whipping up some graphics going into this episode, kind of describing what happened last season. So, Bills um, finishing at the top of the division, thirteen and three. Right, they didn't. They have that one game that was a forfeit because of uh, the Demar Hamlin. I don't know if you want to call that injury, on field death, and resurrection, whatever you want to call that. Um, so they're they're one game short. Dolphins nine and eight, wild card team. Um, you know, started off really hot, went through kind of a midseason slump with Tua's injury, and then kind of came back uh, enough to squeak into the playoffs. Patriots eight and nine, and the Jets finishing last seven and ten, um, which is honestly not reflective of how they played um, that season. I mean, their defense was was lights out, and their offense just really struggled to get it going, even though there was a lot of talent around it. And we'll, we'll dig into that in the film. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, takeaways from last season, man, is that Dolphins are really, really, really freaking good when they have two on the field, and they were really struggling to find a backup that that would get the job done outside of the two. fact that they still made the playoffs, right? Uh, through everything that Miami had to deal with, first year head coach, their, their starting quarterback getting several concussions and back-to-back weeks, the fact that they were even a wild-card team and the fact that they competed with Buffalo in that wild-card matchup. That's right. Um, you know, it credit just to McDaniel how competitive for that, this division honestly. is. Yeah. yeah, and credit to McDaniel for that. Um, you know, Bills, uh, they were obviously a powerhouse last year. I'm curious to see if they will be able to repeat that energy this year. I'm not super confident on that. Um, and then Patriots, as we kind of discussed, right, like, they're they're struggling to adapt. I think we can officially say they are struggling to adapt in the post Tom Brady era for them. They just they're really really having a tough time getting it done. I think you know people are like oh don't doubt Belichick you know give it time. We are now three seasons into no Tom Brady and they have just not really been able to get the same results they were with him. Um and that's okay right. I mean it's that's what happens when you move off of arguably the greatest quarterback of all time. Uh, Bill keeps them, keeps them competitive, but you know, staying competitive isn't enough, especially when you're in a division like this, where everybody is doing everything they can to get better as quickly as possible. So, um, I think we're starting things off with the jets, right. And, you know, they have had obviously the biggest change out of all these teams because they, uh, went and got, you know, I don't know if you want to say the best quarterback in the league right now because of his age, but you know, a hall of fame, one of the best, one of the best, probably top five quarterbacks in the league and Aaron Rodgers. So, you know, people, I think last year were saying, Oh, he fell off a little bit, you know, interception rate went up. I think uh, there's two things to kind of say in relation to that one. I think that he was not fully in it with green Bay. I think that he knew they were going to move off of him. Um, during the season and I also think that he was really struggling to mesh with his young receivers right and I think there was just an increase in mistakes because he was not agreeing with the Packers organization and he was throwing to guys he did not have chemistry with um, which is tough when you're an old man and you're used to throwing to the same guys for years in well well, not only that John too um, as as you watch some of these clips I want I want people to pay attention 
some of these clips are not from last season. They're from his two uh, back-to-back MVP seasons. And big a big part of the reason he won those MVPs was because of his relationship and chemistry with the play caller, uh, who is the play caller now for the New York Jets. So he's reuniting with the same guy that he was back-to-back MVPs with. The last time he was on this guy's team, and this guy was calling plays with Aaron Rodgers as his quarterback, they had a lot of success together. So that's not, that's going to be like, I mean, that's like riding a bike. I mean, the second that they start, right. they already started doing it right in their, in their off season workouts and camp starts here, they're going to get right back into it. Um, I mean, this was, this was from last year. This shows what he's still capable of doing, moving around the pocket. He, the, you know, he's not as, as athletic as he used to be, but look at the footwork, the body control. And then you know, I want you to pause it right when he throws this, look at the window, one, two, three defenders and a receiver that the receiver he's throwing the ball to isn't even on the screen yet, right? <laughs> uh, but to fit it over Lazard and through four defenders like that to one of his favorites, Randall Cobb, like it's hard to do that, man. There's not many dudes in the league that can do this. You can you can count on on one hand maybe how many guys can make this throw if you gave him ten tries. Rogers does it all the time, and uh, I just wanted to remind people that that's what he did last year in a year where everyone said he was down and the Packers were down. He still does that, right? Same and, thing uh, last year. In a, in a game is, that they yeah. had to win to a game that they had to win. This was essentially a playoff game for Green Bay. They had to win this to stay alive. Look at this throw. It's one of the best. Look at the avoiding pressure off his back foot. That is just so sick. And, I mean, perfect placement. And that's the it's thing sick. that, like, I've been watching way too much Aaron Rodgers over my life because, you know, he's usually beating the shit out of the Lions. Um you know, and also basically every other team he's playing every week. I mean, his ability to just like effortlessly just flick the ball and it just is like a a perfect, most easily catchable ball for the receiver he's throwing it to. If you could pick how you want to throw a football in terms of just what it looks like when you release it, you want to look like Aaron Rodgers. It's incredible. It's like, it's just incredible. Uh, and and you and I'm telling you right now, if Josh Allen or Patrick Mahomes did this last year, you would have seen it a million times. But because it was Aaron Rodgers on a down year, you know, you don't you don't you probably haven't seen this clip before, unless right. you're a diehard Packers fan. Um, it's ridiculous. And that was last um, year. So then we is, then you start to look at what prior, he's done. Right? Yeah. This is this is a few years ago. This yeah. is earlier in his career. But this is what made Aaron Rodgers who he is, right? I mean, this is one of the best plays we've ever seen a quarterback make. Um, it's probably the best throw I've ever seen on film by anybody ever. I don't think that we'll ever see a throw like this. I mean, holy arms, shit, like, man. <laughs> it doesn't even make sense. It doesn't even make sense, really. And, I mean, this is what you're trading, you know, which honestly, not that, that huge of a haul, probably because he's towards the end of his career, right? But, I mean, you traded, you know – a conditional first and a second round pick for this dude. Uh, Cause green Bay was ready to move off of him. They seemed content with that haul. And like w- we're going to see in some of the other film here, right? Like this is what this team was missing. They have a very talented running back. Their receiving core is really good. Their offensive line, I would say is above average. It's not maybe top five, but you know, you can definitely say like top 10 or 15, somewhere in that range and not enough where Aaron Rodgers is going to have time. Um, and then their defense is rock solid and their coaching staff is rock solid. So again, I don't think seven and 10 is very reflective of the Jets record. And we're going to go into some film here that kind of demonstrates, you know, the issues they were dealing with. Um, you got to so imagine the- as you show these clips of, of Zach Wilson, and then you show some of the clips of the receivers, you have to imagine. And, and the hardest thing about watching film is you have to flip it and create this in your mind because we haven't seen it for real yet. Aaron Rodgers on this team last year wins 11 games, 12 games, right? Think about how many games the jets were in where they needed a game winning drive, or they just needed one big play on offense to, to allow the running game to get going again, because teams were low in the box, Zach Wilson and and white and Flacco were not able to do that for them. And it was not because of a lack of receivers or lack of running back or lack of a line or lack of play calling. It just wasn't clicking for the quarterbacks. Yeah. And now and, you have one of the best in, in the world on your roster, and you didn't lose a whole lot to get them in terms nope. of your current roster. And you have a defense that's one of the best in the league. So let, let's watch some of this. And, and you got to pretend Aaron Rodgers is now on this roster, going against the same competition that he went against 
last year. And You'll they won seven games. In the, in the play after this that the receivers, too, are visibly frustrated with how Wilson right. is, is and reading it, the, the progression for this play. But, I mean, wide open, runs right by everybody and decides to just bolt to the sideline instead. And, I mean, I think, the uh, Mark, you tell me, like, this is an ample amount of time for the play to develop. And he had an ample amount of, of protection in order to kind of go through his progressions and make a decision, right? Like, like the last ditch effort run to the sideline was something he really didn't need to do given the situation. What's what's crazy, John, if you pause it, right? You're they're in open, right? So five receivers, no running back in the backfield, very, very high percentage pass. The Patriots know this. The Jets are not trying to hide the fact they're going to throw the ball. I assume this is a third down. Um, the Jets, like when you're in this formation, it's kind of a this or that based on what it's very hard to lie. Like the Patriots are, it's going to be really hard to disguise what you're doing to an open five wide set. So it's not like he's getting confused in what he's seeing in the secondary and they're not doing right. anything terribly confusing here. It's a very base defense here, which the Patriots do try to confuse quarterbacks a lot, not here. And really this is like his first read. He's looking the right way. He's looking at the right side of the field. And if the safety comes down, which I know he's looking at and sees Right before he starts to scramble, I know he saw that. It's just a simple release the ball, let it fly, right. trust what you're seeing. He's looking at it. I mean, and it's really frustrating too because, like, we just watch what Aaron Rodgers can do in the pocket to make a play happen, even when it's starting to collapse on him and there's pressure coming in. And I just don't even think there was like even the semblance of of any willpower to try to force that and make it happen. It, and, and this was not a hard throw, by the way. You know, it, like yeah. he's already behind the defense. It, this is just a step and throw. He's not under pressure yet. Yeah. And uh, it, it just, you know, it, it's this. It, and it's one thing if this happens once or twice over the course of the season, because every quarterback is going to miss an open guy like this. It was but a habit. It was a habit. It was this happened more often than it didn't. The crowd was was involved in, in booing, but the players could feel it. You're gonna see it on this clip. This is again, I think right. this was a this was a third look and long. He is here. Garrett yeah, Wilson like... has, yeah, third and twelve. Garrett Wilson has the look they want, gets the gets the inside dig route right at the sticks. And if he just puts this on his body or in front of him, it's a very easy pitch and catch and get down first down. And not and the not the behind only him. open guy in in that that play either. I mean, no, but it is his primary. Play. That's where he's looking. Right. And honestly, it is the right it is the right read. Right. But um, yeah, man. I mean, I don't. And from this angle, when you watch from behind the court, you can see where he's looking. He's looking there the whole way. He <laughs> sees that the safety. I mean, this one one this should have been picked. Yeah. If the DB has any skill at all. I don't know where he's looking, but um, this has to be put on the receiver's body, man. Give him a chance. Give one of the best receivers, the young guys in the league. I mean, this was the rookie offensive rookie of the year. He's thrown the ball to, and you don't even give him a chance to touch the ball. Yeah. And again, I just, I'm not convinced that Aaron Rodgers, you know, would make any such mistake, right? Like that's going to be perfect. I'm not, perfect. we're not <laughs> saying Aaron Rodgers is perfect, but he's rarely going to miss something like that. Yeah, exactly. Um, on the de- now we look at the defensive side of the ball, and this was not the Jets' problem last year. This is what won them seven games, and uh, one of the biggest factors of it is Sauce Gardner, who most would say is a top defensive back in the league. Some would say the best cornerback in the league. Um, so as we look at some of these clips here, what the what the Jets do a good job of is they allow him to have the freedom to be a ball player, right? They don't they they ask him to play a lot of man to man, and sure he'll he'll take guys out. Uh, and he'll just run with you and take you out of a ball game completely. But what I love is his ability. If you go back to that that clip, John, first one, they allow, yeah, they allow him to play this zone look right where he can drop and he can. You see how he's kind of playing between two guys yeah. and he's reading the quarterback's eyes. They allow him to do that because he's so savvy at just look at this one, right? He's got the deep deep quarters look and he sees where Pickett's looking. And he jumps down. That's not even his zone, technically, right? Like, I mean, technically it is, but he's got to stay over the top. He comes right. down because he sees what's happening, right? And also it helps that they get pressure on the quarterback so he's able to do this because quarterbacks don't have all day to make their reads. So Sauce can be very aggressive without having to worry about getting beat deep. Now, when I talk about getting beat deep, it doesn't happen very often on Sauce Gardner because, one, he's fast as shit. Two, he's technically sound and knows how to run into the guy's hip. This is against Jamar Chase. So you go back to the beginning here. 
Jamar Chase is one of the best at doing this, stacking the stacking the corners, getting on top, and making plays. Joe Burrow is one of the best at throwing those balls in the league. We've seen it. We showed it in the FC North <laughs> video, right? Sauce Gardner, okay, one-on-one with one of the best receivers in football. Joe Burrow is licking his chops. Jamar is licking his chops. Take your shot. Sauce Gardner is built for that moment. Runs right through his hip, becomes the receiver, essentially. Turns his eyes at the right time, realizes he can't make the pick, and instead of trying to make the pick, he just makes damn sure that Jamar Chase isn't going to catch it. And that's that's a that's I know that's really technically sound. Um, running through the hip, running through, making a play on the ball without pass interference, right? I mean, that is just outstanding defense. It's teach tape. Yeah, and honestly, he is really good at flirting that line with PI every single time too. Like he gets just handsy enough, and you know. I mean, there's some situations which people were complaining about last season that, like, you know, maybe the refs were a little too easy on him with stuff. But, like, I just think he's legitimately that good at, you know, seeing how close he can get to that line but not crossing it. So, um, yeah. then, well, this is one, one more here of Sauce. I this think. is, this is, I think this is Garrett Wilson, right? Oh, so, Garrett this, Wilson. this shows again, you got to imagine, uh, this is going to be Aaron Rodgers throwing it. Now, now you got to keep in mind the Jets had the best defensive rookie and the best offensive rookie in football last year on the same team. Um, and Brees Hall was probably in the running. And Brees Hall was up there as well before his injury. Out so Garrett Wilson, yeah. just this is a this is a corner route, deep corner route. Um, turns the safety inside out. Just outstanding route running, outstanding hands. You can see it here. The aggressive nature of the head snap, right? Making him think that he's going inside of the post. Safety has to speed turn out of it. Uh, good luck, right? Because with a well-thrown ball, you ain't, you're not recovering after speed turning on a receiver like this. And Aaron Rodgers, this this is their ability to just use play action. You know, it's not even really true play action. It's just a, it looks like it's going to be a run-the-ball formation. They don't even fake a handoff, and they still get this kind of look. It's crazy. Garrett Wilson's one of the better receivers in the NFL. Um, and the fact that he won offensive rookie of the year with the quarterback issues they were having, <laughs> I mean, it's ridiculous. Yeah. And I mean, the, the rest of their receiving core is nothing to sneeze at either. So, um, and with, with a fully healthy Brees Hall, I mean, that's going to be a scary, scary offense to play against. And, and again, oh, I think it's the biggest thing, John, I think is the OC reuniting with Rodgers and now right. adding Lazard and some of these other guys that he's familiar with mixed in with the Jets guys like Conklin, who we've had on the show a few times, and Garrett Wilson and Brees Hall. Like, that's going to be – and these guys are young and excited to play and compete, right, because the Jets haven't been competitive in a long time. It's very similar to the Detroit Lions, and all of a sudden they're competitive, and everyone's buying into it because it's like we're not supposed to be good. We've never been good, right? right? But all of a sudden we are, and our fans are behind us, and this coaching staff believes in us. you got hard knocks – coming to New York, right? It's so similar to what we saw with Detroit last year. I just think that the Jets are even better than yeah. Detroit was, right? That's that's why, again, I would do just about anything to see a Jets-Lions Super Bowl. I, I know that's, that's it would not... Be beautiful. It's not totally out of the question. It's obviously not likely, but I mean, just with the, the Aaron Rodgers story, both of these teams being shitty for so long, like, it's it would be so sick. So... Anyways, that's what I'm pulling for, whether or not it actually happens, probably low likelihood. But um, so moving on to the Bills, which, you know, the, the my only complaint with the Bills on their draft class or offseason, you know, on the note of running back, I do feel like they should have made more efforts to upgrade at the running back position because of the fact that it has been a liability for them. And not just a liability for them as in their running backs aren't doing, you know, the job that you're hoping they could do with how good their offensive line is and the rest of the offense is. But then instead they're, you know, having essentially a higher percentage of designated runs for the quarterback. And that's all fine and dandy when again, Josh Allen's a freaking superhero, absolute monster of human being, but you know, injuries become a concern. Um, his longevity as a player becomes a concern when you are kind of putting him in those situations, not to say that you can't use him at all in that, but that was a very frequent uh, situation for the Bills, and I don't know how sustainable it is because now we're three years in of, of them doing that stuff. And, you know, a Allen did not look the same in the second half of the season after he kind of, you know, started to look a little bit more beat up. So I I'm interested to see what they end up doing with that. However, you know, Dalton Kincaid, arguably the best tight end prospect in this draft. Um, you know, there's, there's maybe two or three guys in that conversation. 
Um, so just taking a look at some of the film and the, and the weapon that the Bills are getting out of him. I anticipate them using him more of like a slot receiver, right? Um, they, they lost Cole Beasley, who is like that shorter slot receiver, quicker receiver. And I think they're going to replace him and use Kincaid similar to how like you see the Chiefs use a Kelsey, right? Um, they're receiving tight ends. They're not fantastic blockers. You're not going to see them. You know, I think Dawson Knox is going to do more of that stuff. But the fact that you have Kincaid at, at like the H or like a slot, and then you have Dawson Knox who can play like the Y, you can be in true two tight end sets and run plays as if you're in like a four wide out set right. because of their athleticism and their ability to do that. So I think that that's why the Bills went with him in the first round. Um, I didn't love the pick at first. I still don't love it. I think there were other things they probably should have focused on. But when you see him make plays like this and you understand that Josh Allen's going to be the one throwing the ball, it's hard to really hate it, you know? I'm trying to see where he's at on the screen. He's in the, he's, this is the same play, different angle. It just gotcha. shows it, it shows the release, right? You can see him up at the top. And then his ability, he's a go-getter. He's, if the ball's in the air, he's got the frame, he's got the athleticism. You know, the ref calls him out, but it's one of those catches where he was not out of bounds. And they reviewed it, and he was ruled in bounds. So it's one of those things where um, with Josh Allen and, and that offense and how they want to sling the ball around, because for whatever reason, they do not want to commit to the run, like you said. Right. Um, he's another weapon that they add to that passing attack that is really hard to stop. And taking a look at, you know, Allen's ability to as a, as a quarterback, right? right. So much versatility because he's a threat no matter how you use him. This um, this is showing the, the how they use him to run the ball, right? So uh, if you go back to the beginning, John, running the ball in the football, running the ball in football, period, is about numbers. It's simple math. OK, so if you can understand how to add and subtract, you can understand running. If pre-snap, there's options on what they're going to do on this play. And up in the box, you know, they can they're trying to change the play. They're going to give him a signal to change the play. Josh is seeing what he sees in the defense. He can work to the three man side and probably some short, some kind of quick pass game or he can keep the ball, follow a guard tackle pull. And now the running back is an extra blocker. So the whole the whole thing with offensive football is if the quarterback's the one carrying the ball, you get an added blocker in the running back because you're not handing it to him and then having the quarterback just stand there, right? right? So now you get an extra guy to help guide you. And so this they just overpower the weak side by pulling. And it's just this is just quarterback power with three guys, guard, tackle, and running back. And he's done a better job of sliding and protecting himself. But like you said. How much longer can the Bills rely on this, right? Because you don't want to call this too many times. You see how he looked over to the right? Mm -hmm. That was just to freeze the defense, but he did right. have an option to go to the right side. Um, it's it's a beautiful thing that the Bills do a lot of, but you don't want to do too much of that with your quarterback. Here's the same thing, right? He has the option to throw this. So you'll see he has the option to throw this to Singletary. See the motion? See how see how yeah, white looks there for you a see second. how Devin yeah. White chases it? Yeah. Right? I mean he so totally he the, bites because of that. Just on, because he, of that. Look. He's responsible yeah. for uh singletary on that play. Right. It makes it really hard though when your quarterback's able to do the things Josh Allen does with his feet. It's it's ridiculous a guy his size is doing this shit. Look at the the hesitation. I'm one of the best linebackers in football. Right. Um, it's very, very scary what he's able to do. But again, like you said. They cannot rely on this from their franchise player much longer because, like most running backs, you're not going to be able to do this very long in the league and, and stay in the league healthy. Yeah, and it's, he's, again, he's it's the like quarterback. It's, he not that he's not that. good at it; he's incredible. He's at incredible it. He's, at it. And there's the times to do it, ever. right? Yeah. There's times to do it. Like the Eagles did a really good job with Jalen Hurts in the playoffs. Of they didn't do a lot of that with Jalen Hurts because he had a banged up shoulder. But when they needed it. They called it, and it was right. very effective, right? And I actually, the 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 less you call it, the more effective it is, because defenses aren't prepared for it, and you have to honor all the other stuff you're showing. So, right, you know, not to mention Kincaid and Josh Allen's running ability, and Gabe Davis, and all these other guys they have. Stephon Diggs is one of the best route runners, is one of the best receivers in football. I know there's been a bunch of drama. We've done episodes of talking about it. But at the end of the day, this guy can flat out play the receiver position very well. He's got great chemistry with Josh Allen, even if it doesn't always look like it and they're, and they're bickering on the sidelines. It's because both these guys are competitors and want to win. If yeah, you put on the film really and watch Diggs, 
listen, man, this guy is a quarterback's dream to throw the ball to. He gets open all the time. He's one of the cockiest dudes in the league. And listen, cockiness, you can criticize it all you want, but if you back it up with your play, there's not really shit you can say about it. And he backs it up. And here's the thing too. This, this is Lattimore that he's doing this to. That's one of yeah. the better cornerbacks in this league. And I mean, he just completely destroys it on this route. Like it's, um, God, and the quickness, man, in and out of the <laughs> breaks. Look at that. This is the deception, right? The footwork the is suddenness. Ridiculous. The suddenness of his change of direction is what, look at the boom. You really believe he's going there and then boom, he's back out. It's yep. the suddenness of the change of direction. It's the, it's the hips, right? The footwork, it's the head fake, all of it. Crazy, sells. crazy route. And then you see, it's not like this happens by coincidence. This is here in practice, uh, running a similar route more down the field here. Um, but look at this this poetry in motion, man. Watching how these guys sell it with the eyes and then get back in, right? I mean, it's not by accident that you see it happen on Sundays. He does this shit all the time in practice. He practices this with Josh Allen. He does this on air. He does this with cones. He does this with coaches watching. He does it by himself. He does it on his brother when they're when they're just hanging out in the offseason. Like this is what they do. And it translates to Sundays. And there's the confidence, right? Skipping and celebrating. I don't love all that shit, but again, you back it up. Ben, oh, and by the way, on the defensive side of the ball, John, I was going to say, and Matt then, Milano, look, there's, they there's, just signed an extension, which is awesome. Um, and look, I will say this just before we get into this, like my biggest, you know, question marks around Buffalo right now is how big is cook going to make a jump? Um, this coming year as, as a running back. Cause again, I think relief for Josh Allen is really important here. And then, you know, interior defensive line, I think, was a problem towards the latter half of the season or just, you know, throughout the season for them. But one thing that they do have to kind of help with that is, holy crap, are their linebackers good? Um, and, and they lost Edmonds to Chicago. I was going to say, they lost they, they Edmonds. Did keep, but... They did keep Matt Milano, who was the heart and soul of their defense, and he'll be around for a while. This guy was up there in tackles for loss in the league last year. Um he just does a great job of recognizing plays and he's such a good window runner. He's such a good window runner. He just, he just has a knack for getting underneath some of those bigger offensive linemen. He knows how to fight off blocks. And when he's not blocked, he's sure as hell putting the ball down. This is what I'm hoping to God. Jack Campbell looks like next year for the lions here. I, I hope so. But uh, I think Matt Milano is just more of a athlete. You know, I think he's more mm -hmm. of a get, get the hat on the ball no matter if it's an outside or inside run play. I mean, some of these plays you can see are inside like that. He'll blow it up, but yeah. some of them are like outside run plays and he'll get there. Ridiculous. I, they blitz him. Look at the patience there. He knows his job, right? He's prepared for cutback. Like he's just a very, look, here's him in coverage. And this is what not many linebackers can do. Get out in space and make plays like that. He's an inside linebacker doing that. You know, it's ridiculous. It's, it's, it's awesome. They're going to be better on defense. I think, They've got to fix the, stopping the run game. Cincinnati destroyed them in Buffalo, in the snow. There is no excuse for that. And they have to fix that. Otherwise, I don't know how they come out of the AFC. And then, okay, now we're at Dolphins. But, yeah, I mean, they're – and look, they, they didn't lose a lot this offseason at all. Um, I just – I do have questions about them, right? Are they going to be a 13-win team or potentially 14-win team, you know, again, like – that's my big question, especially with how competitive their divisional competition has gotten, right? The Jets are not going to be an easy feat. The Dolphins are not going to be an easy feat. And, you know, the Patriots still, you know, no matter the regression that they've had, are still a very competitive team. So, Oh, and by the way, if you haven't noticed, it used to be teams in this division were drafting and signing players to, to beat Tom Brady and the Patriots. Like everything they were doing was how do we beat them? It's become how do we beat Buffalo? And so you see teams getting guys that can run with Josh Allen and can put pressure on Josh Allen. You've seen these teams invest in the pass rush. You've seen Miami invest in speed. All right. The next 20 minutes or whatever we're talking about Miami is going to be about speed. They fastest said, we're going to be, we're going to be the, the fastest. Well, only not only offense, their defense is lightning fast too. They said, we're just going to be faster than Buffalo. And, and that's how we're going to beat them. And that's their, that's their philosophy. And listen, they're right about one thing. They have the speed, and we'll see if it works out for them with Tua healthy. But holy shit, man. They're explosive at every position on offense, and in their secondary and linebacking court, they are fast. Tyreek Tyre Hill, 
You want to go to the oh, just this, is the, this is the fumble. This is the this fumble. Is the fumble and, and we'll see the play. I was like, the, what yeah, the hell is going on? I thought this was about Tyreek. And <laughs> I remembered. You forget uh, that, yeah, Tyreek's just standing there. Ball pops out. He, he it, just yeah, pops turn, out. I mean, he runs, he runs more yards here than anyone else on the field and still beats everybody. It's incredible. Um, and we'll you'll Absolutely see the film nice. of the actual play. If you want to read off the stat on that, John. Yeah, so he reached a top speed of just under 22 miles an hour, um, traveled a total distance of 93 yards. He has reached over 20 miles an hour on 54 ch- touches since 2018, which is more than double than the next closest player, which is Saquon. He That's is ridiculous. literally lightning in a bottle. He is so freaking fast. Um, you, I mean, in, in a league where everybody's fast, to be that fast and the next closest guy is like literally you're half you're more half <laughs> the numbers here's I the play so you crazy. know that we just yeah here's the actual play we showed again heads up play obviously fluke play nothing about the play stands out besides the speed tyree kill he's he's just electrifying man he changed and he so he changes how you have to play defense because you can't play him ever in man-to-man without having to worry um and not to mention, like he he's going to open everybody else up, and he's going to make Tua's job so much easier because you got to commit a couple guys to him, or you have to play a high zone. And if you do that, the underneath stuff's going to be there. And who and this who is not some, from that the running game, Gazeki, Waddle, Mostert, yeah, Mostert. and then you got Waddle. I mean, who by the way, Mostert and Waddle are also both just ridiculously ridiculously fast. fast. Some <laughs> of the fastest guys in the league. So it's that that's just I guess what they wanted their strength to be and holy shit does it show up on tape. Um that's like a play you see in like middle school football but he's doing it <laughs> right with the best. look at Jalen Waddle's speed on this next clip. Yeah and you and pair really these two together to, to, Tua is so critical to the success of this team. I know there's been a lot of drama, there's been a lot of hate um, and I'm still not sold on the idea that he is just like this long-term franchise answer. But one thing that for sure was apparent this past season is that the Dolphins needed him to function as an all They're a different was, team with Tua than they are without him. Totally that's different. I'm sure. I mean, and if that's, McD- you know, hats off to McDaniel for getting the best out of him. Hats off to Tua for, you know, probably being able to, to fulfill that role that McDaniel needed him to do. But regardless, and this play is amazing. Jalen Waddle <laughs> is like, holy shit. Look, I mean, look at look at him and Tyreek just outrun the entire defense. Tyreek's just basically escorting him there. If you go back to the beginning, this is all set up by play action, which Miami's ability to run the ball. Linebackers step up, creates a window. Tua puts it with pressure right on the money, and then it's the afterburners. It's the open, like just the ability in open field to make people look stupid at the professional level. These are guys that their job is to tackle. Like their job in the secondary is to cover and tackle, and you make them look bad. You make them look bad. This is one of the best players in football. I believe it's Jair Alexander. Takes a dive. No chance. So ridiculous. Home run, home run potentially on every single offensive play, those two. And you can see right here, they combined for 15 touchdowns on 214 targets with Tua at at quarterback in 2022. And without Tua, neither had a touchdown on a combined 73 targets. John, as you said, you have to give the credit where it's due. With Tua on the field, these two guys are probably up there as as one of the best duos in football at the receiver position. You could could argue Jamar and T. Higgins and some of these other things. Um, But – Damn, it's tough, right? These two are in the conversation. And with two at quarterback, very different than with without him. And then uh, this is another one of Waddle, I think. Yeah. Yeah, but so. it's giving it gives credit here. You know, this is this is really to show what Tua can do. Obviously, Jane Waddle is the recipient of it, but this throw is just it's special, man. Like I mean <laughs> Look, I, I get like it's it's a little bit different in the NFL, but I mean, even just how quickly some of those DBs just bail on. I mean, they're just jogging right if, in. There's like, there's no way I'm catching this. If, you, if you're going to play like the Bills here are, this is again, an in-division opponent they're going to see twice a year. If you're going right. to play aggressive underneath coverage and give up the vertical, 
Tua is very accurate, man. And Jalen Waddle and Tyreek Hill, if they get the ball with any bit of space, good luck. I think he did his, his Waddle celebration. One of the best celebrations in football, by the way, because <laughs> it actually makes sense. The penguin, uh, it's so yeah. good. Yeah. Um, and then, yeah, I mean, here's, I think this is just all like just to, uh, you know, making plays here too. And again, this like, is, this is, yeah, this is giving credit to Tua, show, showing what he, the, the accuracy, like I said, down the field throws. Um, people want to talk about, does he have the arm strength? He absolutely does. You know, you can't get caught up in one practice clip of him under throwing Tyreek Hill. Listen, anyone would under throw Tyreek Hill every once in a while. The dude is literally lightning. Yeah, it's hard not to. You have to throw a perfect timing to throw a good ball to Tyreek. Even and and that that takes time to I think adjust as a quarterback because like when you're used to your progressions being, you know, timed a certain way, and then all of a sudden the receivers you're throwing to can get to those spots so much faster than what you're used to. I mean, we saw it with Goff and uh, JMO last year, right? right? Those first couple of games, Goff wasn't under throwing JMO because like his his arm was weak. It was because literally he just wasn't used to throwing placing the ball there as quickly as Jamo could get there. Right. And, yeah. And, that, and I love, you know, two has got this quick release. It's he honestly has one of the prettiest throws in, in, in all of the NFL. Uh, yeah. He's been doing stuff he's like accurate this. the well. ball placement is, it's really, really special. I mean, he's been doing this since he was at Alabama. That's what was, that's what his name of the game was. He's one of the most accurate. This is across his body, across field in a window. Like some of the stuff you're watching, there's just, it's incredible. The accuracy. And we, we, we give credit to these outstanding quarterbacks a lot on this podcast, but people don't realize, like, they make it look so easy. And people, this is what they expect them to do. Like, this is this a touch pass. You have a line drive throw. You have progression throws. You have play action throws. You have so many different things um, that are going on for them. And to be able to, like, do that and, and throw between bracket coverage and shit, like, it's next level stuff. They, they ask question. a lot is, of these guys. Is the right tackle for the Dolphins technically the left tackle in the sense that he's the one protecting, protecting the, the blind side? Yeah. Um, I mean, no, not, not like, like, yes. I mean, they're, they're probably, they're probably asking the right tackle to protect as if he is a left tackle, if that's what you're saying. Right. Um, because yeah, it is his blind side. Right. I'm just, I'm curious. Cause I actually don't know, like, are they putting their, their best, uh, their best tackle on to his blind side, which would obviously once again, be the right side. I'm not sure. Um, yeah. Anyways, go, going to Patriots, which again, like we don't have as much film on them. And I think one of the reasons is like, we're, we're still sitting with a lot of questions with them from a coaching standpoint. Um, obviously they're not retrying the Patricia experiment, which was an unmitigated disaster. And if you're a tr Detroit fan watching the show, we know quite a lot about Patricia being an unmitigated disaster. I mean, John, we um, called that the second they made that decision last off yeah. season. We said, yep. we said fat Trisha is going to call the offense. They're going to struggle. Like that, that <laughs> won't work. And we, and you've seen the memes and the clips of Mac Jones cussing him out. And like, dude, like, he wanted it off with his, his head. Yeah. Like what, what are we do? Like as a quarterback who's trying to like make something happen and win a game, and you don't have any like none. Of, you're not on the same page at all with your play caller. That's not that's not good. Yeah, and I think um, you know. However, the the Patriots defense was just as good as they usually are, and I mean Judon is one of the win, more man. underappreciated players, um, you know, in the league, honestly, because he is kind of an edge rusher you aren't hearing as much about compared to some of the other big names. And holy crap, is this guy good? I mean, yeah. so anyways. You could see, uh, you know, this is, again, this guy's coverage. So, yeah, you got to slow it down. And, and you can kind of see what they're doing, bailing, showing pressure early on to Tua, bailing out of it. Um, they're, they're really just rushing forward here. And because of, like yep. you said, the success of Judon, they're able to do this and drop so many guys back. Um, but if you go back again in, in an even slower mode, John, I can kind of explain yep. why this interception happens, what Tua doesn't see, and what they disguise it as. So, they, they basically, they put this guy – from the showing blitz drops into the hole. He's scanning the field. Okay. So you look, he's showing blitz pre-snap on the snap bails. He's responsible watching the left side of he's a whole player. Basically as a whole player, he's just reading the quarterback's eyes to, I don't think ever saw him in, in coverage because he thought he was going to blitz. Right? right. So he drops right into it, reads the route perfectly, gets eyes on Tua, sees that he's throwing the ball, jumps it almost a pick six. 
No, it was a pick six. Oh, it was a pick yeah. six. Doesn't even get tackled. Pick I six. mean, it just so, Heisman's the shit out of whoever this guy is. There, and you can <laughs> see it, right? Like, and this is because of the pre-snap to a thought that he had this. And they, but again, pre-snap lie, pre-snap lie by New England. Typical Bill Belichick shows you one thing, does another thing. Similar to like the Steelers coverage breakdown I did. There's no secret to success in Pittsburgh, in New England, all these defense towns, right? Like get home, pressure the quarterback, drop a lot of guys in the secondary and confuse the shit out of quarterbacks. Like that's, that's the name of the game. And here's just another example of it. Um, well, then here's here's Judon. Sorry, oh, drawing a hold, right? Right. We'll so watch. We'll watch how many guys the what the the Dolphins commit seven guys on this play to pass pro because against New England on third and eleven, what do you think they're dialing? Yeah. And you talk pressure. about a numbers game, right? How many do they actually rush? As it said, only five, five. right? So disguising that, but too bad, right? The rest of your guys are look how many it looks pre-snap. Look how many it looks I mean, that are looks like play. they're bringing the house. looks like they're bringing one, two, three, four, five, six, seven one. guys. So they keep seven in to protect. They drop two guys into coverage, and then they still get home with one, two, there's, there's three, getting four, and Judon got held. So four of the five him. guys still get to Tua. You could argue five of the five, but I, he, I mean. Yeah, I that's mean, the problem. Holy right? shit! What a pass rush! I mean, the running back got just bull rushed all the way back, puts pressure. I mean, anytime that you can do that, and you have two guys trying to block you, like Matt Judon had there, and you draw a hold, but you also still create pressure and make him move out of the pocket so that the other guy's blitzing can get hands on to a. Not to mention, great job pressing the receivers here, not allowing them to have easy routes so that nothing is quickly open for Tua to hit early. Yeah. makes them hold the ball and that's what new england does man they have these low scoring games where they just hang around if they can get offensively better new england could be a threat that like you never can count them out of this division because of who their coach is and because of what they do defensively now offense is where there's you know uh an increasing amount of issues maybe they'll rectify them without patricia you know around trying to figure out i guess how to call nfl offenses um but I mean, what are your feelings on Mac Jones? We'll, we'll get into some of the film here. Like, do you think he's, you know, the guy for the Patriots? Do you he think is you're be rolling with him. He is to me, uh, in the right circumstances, so so similar to Tua. He is one of the most accurate passers in football. He's poised. He's calm. He's collected. He can read the defenses. The moment isn't too big for him. He can move around better than most people give him credit for. Um, uh, but he's just not in a great quarterback system right now. He doesn't have any sort of consistency with the play calling, uh, or, or any identity of what they're trying to do offensively. And so there's times like on this play where you'll, he'll flash this greatness. And then there's times where it's like Mac Jones is a no show. Right. And how, how much did we see that in Tua in the beginning of his career? Right. right? When he was struggling with OCs and head coaches and stuff like that. I mean, this is perfectly placed. From Mac Jones. See if and he get Peyton Manning's commentary on it. I don't know if you guys can yeah. hear. It's a scissors concept. I don't so I don't know if you can hear. I'll talk a little bit too, but it's a scissors concept. Very easy read. Um, no hesitation. He sees what they're doing defensively and makes it happen. They spotlight, you know, this again, all, all these concepts, it's not like a lot of them are new. Like these are it's a very easy read. The single high safety takes away the post you throw the corner, right? And it kind of creates kind of a, a pick, if you will. The post creates kind of a pick on the defender. Mm-hmm. And they're seeing that, that make sure that corner stays up top. He does. And then you know that you have the the corner out. Here's some of the best ever thrown it. Dan Marino, that's pretty damn well thrown ball. And here's Mac Jones. Kind of crazy to compare Mac Jones and Dan Marino and Peyton Manning and Joe Montana on the same uh, clip. But that's the kind of accuracy we're talking about with like some of the best ever. Yeah, and, you know, it's, again, like, that does take a special quarterback to be able to pull off that that kind of accuracy in a play like that, though. And so, you know, who is he throwing to this season? I mean, there's Juju Smith. That's going to be interesting. The other thing, man. Yeah, but, I mean, Juju Smith coming to New England, that didn't make much sense. I don't know if yeah. his personality fits what they do, but 
I don't know, man. They did bring Randy Moss there uh, towards the end of Randy's career, and he fit in fine. But they had Tom Brady to kind of even him out, you know. Big ego, superstar player. They brought him in, made him extremely humble, and he just worked because he wanted to win. And him and Tom Brady worked really well together. Now, I'm not saying Juju is Randy Moss, but I'm saying characteristic-wise, like in how they carry themselves and how they act, there's there's some similarities. Yeah, and, you know, hopefully – uh the, whoever's I don't know who's actually calling plays for the Patriots going to the season, but Not whoever's for sure. right, whoever's responsible for that with the you know and the combination of Mac Jones being a you know pretty level headed mature guy, even though you know this is only what year three for them in the season. Um, you know I'm I'm looking forward to seeing you know will the Patriots be better than they were last year? I mean their defense is going to be rock solid. Um, you know is the offense going to be able to keep up in a, a very competitive division with you know all three teams have really damn good defenses so and one um, thing that we forget about john before we move on is yeah. the patriots thrive um and they take pride in their special teams and they always have and what people don't realize is 25 percent of the snaps of a football game are special team snaps and they do it better than anyone else right so 25 percent of the time on those plays they have an advantage they're way smarter. They're way better coach. Their scheme is better and their execution is better and has been for 25 years. Right. They block punts. They set up punt returns. They set up kick returns. They win the field position game. Uh, oh, by the way, they drafted a guy out of Michigan state from around where we're from. Okay. Uh, Bryce Beringer, one of the best punters in the country. He's going to flip the field. He's very accurate on his short field punts. He knows how to pin them deep. And that's what they take pride in, right? That's why their defense thrives because they pin them inside the 10 yard line every single time as an offense. It's frustrating as hell. You got to drive 90 yards right. to try to get points like against the Patriots defense. It's not fun. And they yeah. just do that for four quarters. I mean, you saw Detroit get shut out because you get frustrated and you start trying to do things downfield and then they get a sack and then they get a strip and then they get a pick. And it's like, Oh my God, this game got out of hand. Right. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's that's the name of their success. They always have the ability to do that to any team because, like you said, I mean they're they're prepared in that phase all the time, and they all can the make time. teams pay for it if they're not prepared. So, um, you know, going over the lines here, right? I mean, uh, win totals, Patriots above seven and a half. Ooh, these lines are hard. These are all four of these are really tough, man. I'm going to say that the Patriots will get over seven and a half wins, though. I don't know where those wins are going to come from in division. I think they'll be able to get it. They'll still, man. I'm going to go. I'm going to go under because of their division. I just cannot see them winning more than maybe two division games this year. I, I just, it's, I don't know. I just can't see it. So that's that's kind of where my math comes from. Um, but Miami at nine and a half. I'm going to go with under. I don't think Miami is going to be as good as they were last year. Just, I think teams will start to figure them out a little bit more. Um, they'll do different things to how they're playing against Waddle and, and Tyree kill. And they'll force them to run the ball more, which might work, but it's harder to win a game when you can't hit those home runs and steal points. Um, yeah, I'm going to take under for the dolphins as well. Um, to his health is a huge question mark for me. And I do agree too. with you too, that I just, I don't think they're going to have that same element of surprise. Um, but they will have the speed, so we'll see what comes with you that. You will have the speed, and speed kills. Um, the Jets, I'm going to go over, and okay. I can't wait to watch Hard Knocks, and I can't wait to see it all develop. Um, but it's I about think we go three over. weeks I, away, by the way, August 8th, I believe. Yeah, I mean, honestly, if you're a betting man, okay, this is, to me, one of the best bets you can make preseason if you're an over-under guy on uh, season win totals because the New York Jets won seven games last year with Flacco, Zach Wilson, and and Mike White playing quarterback. they now Mike have White was Rogers. the best of the three of them. <laughs> yeah, they now have Aaron Rodgers with the same roster, essentially the same schedule, uh, the same defense, the same coach. And keep in mind, now paired up with the OC that he won back-to-back -back MVPs with. Yeah. And you think they're not going to win, you know, two and a half more games? You don't think that, like, they could have won nine, they could have won 10 games last year with the situation they had going on like that's to me that's crazy but yeah i mean yeah, you I'm see how they them. lost a couple of those games so, you know the lions game comes top of mind they do have a tough ass out of division schedule i will yeah. say 
But I think they'll rise to the occasion. I mean, the whole AFC is a bloodbath, right? So um, at some point, you can't make excuses for strength of schedule. You just got to say, hey, you're either going to do it or you're not. Um, so I'm going to take over for the Jets. Bills, I also have pause with. But, you know, do I think they're going to regress from going for a 13 slash 14 win team down to being under 10 wins? Um, yeah, I, I think I'll take over here. I think 11, 12 wins sounds about right for them. Because, again, like, you know, from a personnel standpoint, from a coaching standpoint, they really didn't take any steps back. I'm just curious if, you know, trying the same formula for the fourth year in a row really is, you know, what it's going to take for them to be a Super Bowl contender. So that's that's kind of where I'm concerned. But I still think, like, you know, 11 wins is 100% the realm of possibility for them. I'm going to go over on the Bills. I think it's possible as well. Um but I'm going to go under. I, I just, again, to me, strength of schedule, this division uh, is not a walk in the park at times like it was last year, especially early on. Buffalo just ran through teams. Um, I don't see them coming out of the gates and doing that this year. Uh, and Josh Allen, the more they've shown of Josh Allen, the easier it is to prepare for them. Like you said, the element of surprise is gone. His running game, that, that whole thing is going to look different. And, uh, Part of me just thinks Madden curse, dude. It's it's listen, it's cliche, but I just don't see how Buffalo wins more than it's 10 legit, games. Man. With, with the it's schedule legit. they have, I it's tough. Look, I, I was not a believer in the Madden curse, and then I literally went back 20 years and looked at just about every single one of those guys and the teams, and sure enough, like you know, you can't argue with the numbers, they don't lie. So that that was legit for the most part. Um, very few players came out of that unscathed. So yeah, I'm, I'm definitely concerned about it. Um, but anyways, that, that's a wrap up for the AFC East. I'm very excited about this division. Where do you think that the standings are going to end up at the end of the season? Oh man, this is the hardest one we've done yet. We've, we've done the AFC North. We've done the, uh, I thought, I think AFC North was harder. Personally. AFC North and NFC and NFC North. Um, we've already done. Go check those out if you haven't seen them yet. Um, man, I'm gonna I'm gonna go with the Jets winning this division. Okay. So they're the, they're the top dogs. I'm gonna put the Bills at the second spot. Okay, I think we're about to have the same the same pick with Miami close behind. Yep. And Pats last, and the Pats will be last. I have the exact same standings in my head. So um, it's crazy. To, you know, it sounds crazy like the New York Jets winning this division because it just hasn't, you know, hasn't felt like a real possibility in forever. But Aaron Rodgers in, is in town, man. And he's thinking Super Bowl. They're thinking Super Bowl. And in order to win the Super Bowl, you got to start with uh, probably winning your division. You know, that's yeah. that's the first that's the first step. So I don't know. Though Josh Allen is Superman. And. I've been a big believer in Josh Allen the last few years, and he's he's definitely done some amazing things. Both of those has, games, man. Both of those division games against those those two teams are going to be freaking. Interestingly awesome. enough, interestingly enough, John, I think that, and this is this is weird, but I think it's true. I think the Bills match up better against the Jets than they do against Miami or New England. So I could see the Bills sweeping the Jets and still losing to them overall in the right. division. If that makes sense. Yeah, no, I, I could see Miami possible. beating. I could see Miami beating the Bills twice. I could see New England stealing one or two from the from the Bills, and I think the Bills lose to to teams that can just flat out run the ball, which they play a lot of this year. So, right. I don't know. It just that Jets defense uh, makes me think that they're going to hold on and win some of those closer out of out of division games, and the Bills will struggle in some of those. Right. So it'll come down to your out of division schedule, and I think that the Jets will do better with theirs than buffalo no i don't i don't uh i don't disagree with you i'm really ex this division is probably you know the division i'll probably be watching the most outside of the nfc north um, i'm personally really excited for it and like mark said we so so far we've done the afc north the nfc north we just finished the afc east next week we are going to do the nfc east uh, which is going to be another interesting division should be fun to cover um, that will be the halfway point for our division coverages. We're going to go full fantasy football, you know, perfect timing for that. It'll be like first week of August or whatever that those episodes will be dropping. Uh, we're going to do full coverage of those. Mark and I's takes for fantasy football last year aged very, very well. 
Um, and we, we both, both won our leagues. Yep, we both so won our leagues. Um, if you want to win your league, check check that episode out because <laughs> I promise you. Yeah, uh, and we're we gonna do a, a, a live streamed mock draft as well. So that'll kind of be fantasy football extravaganza. We're gonna have a, a blockbuster episode matched with probably an hour and a half, two hour long fantasy live stream. Um, I did a really good job kind of selecting rookies that I thought were gonna be, um, you know, prominent, and they absolutely plugged gaps in my roster because I was getting late round value out of them. So um, that's something I plan on doing a lot of research on again this year. Of course, it's a little bit of a crapshoot. That's the point of drafting rookies. But man, you get one or two of those guys on your roster and it makes a world of difference. So we're really stoked for that. Again, thank you to anybody that's new here that tuned in. Please subscribe. Keep up with us. We're going to be check us out on social media too, yep. guys. We have check us out. All of those of will pop up in the, the end of episode banner here. Um, so you'll see all that. And then also we're going to be launching a discord um, in the next week or two. So we're looking forward to that kind of, you know, not only interacting with this community that we've built a little bit more, but, you know, also just, you know, fun place to have discussion off screen. We're probably going to be doing some exclusive stuff there as well. Um, be it live streams, uh, early access to merch drops, all of that good stuff. So uh, we will keep you guys in the loop when that launches. If it's not next week, it will definitely be the week after. Um, hope you guys have a good night. We will see you for the NFC East next week. See you guys. Peace.